I want to introduce to you our worship team. So we have Maina, we have Luis, Sifa, Deva, Arzinda, Janet, we have Josh on the drums, and we have Diane on the piano. Amen. Let's give them a hand. We also have Dory and uh, Eddie and Rich at the sound and, and the video. We'll, we'll show them your, we'll show you their faces ne next time. Just remind me, like, you know, give me a call if you're watching online. Give me a 952 uh, 220-8117. Amen. Welcome, welcome again to our worship service. We are Brookdale Christian Center. We are uh, multi-generational and inter, uh, inter ages, inter races uh, church. So we are, we're blessed to be worshiping with you and opening the Word of God with you today. Today I want to take us, by the grace of God, one big, huge leap or step up. I want to talk to you about the second coming of Christ. In those times of uh, pestilence, in those times of pandemic, it is a time when people say, well, is it the end? Is, is Jesus coming? Is, is what's happening uh, a sign? And I would like to look at that question from different angles. First, we are in the last days, in what the Bible and Jesus calls the last days. I want to look with you at the signs of the second coming and how they are intensifying. But also, I want to talk to you about how we're called to love the Lord in those, in those times. So yes, <clears throat> we are in the last days. Actually, we have been in the last days for more than 2,000 years. We've been in the last days since the day, exactly the day of Pentecost. The countdown for the last days started on the day of Pentecost. We read in Acts chapter 2, verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words. For these, and he was talking about those that were praising God in tongues, for these are not drunk as ye suppose, since it is only nine in the morning. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And here is a quotation. And it shall come to pass, in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. So, what Peter is explaining there is that what happened at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down on the upper room and when people were filled with the Spirit for the first time because in the Old Testament some individuals would be under the power of the Spirit for some special missions or messages at certain moments but now what's happening with Pentecost is that the Spirit is on the earth Jesus has gone back to heaven and as he promised, he has sent the Holy Spirit. So today, if I would ask you the question, where is the Holy Spirit? What would you say? 
here. Let's right answer. The Holy Spirit is on earth. The Holy Spirit is on earth. And if you have received Christ as your Savior, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is in you. So we can say, the, let's do it with me, to say the Holy Spirit is here. If you have received Jesus, say it, the Holy Spirit is here. That's why we have everything that we need to live a life pleasing to God because of the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself uh, said the same thing a little bit before in the book of Acts in chapter 1. It says in chapter 1 verse 4, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses of me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. What Jesus is saying, what Peter will then say is that the last days have started with the coming of the Holy Spirit. Jesus has gone back to heaven. He is seated at the right of hand of the Father, and the Father and the Son have sent the, the Holy Spirit to, to earth. So, we, we may say, well, uh, yes, uh, we've been talking about, about the second coming of Jesus for, for 2,000 years. Well, actually, they started talking about it right away. They started talking about it right away. And even Peter, uh, in his second letter, chapter 3, verse 3, says, Beloved, I'll now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandments of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this, they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering or patient towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, which is changing your mind and focusing and believing in God and, and in Jesus and being sorry for our, our sins. Paul 
expecting the Lord to come back in his day. He, he said, uh, uh, what, don't worry when we die because then we will resurrect. And he put himself in the, the group for him. It was something that was imminent. He says in 1 Thessalonians 4, we who are alive, he says we, he puts himself in the group, we who are alive will be caught up in the air. So Paul believed in the rapture and that it could happen uh, in his own day. There were even people who thought it had already happened. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 2, now brethren concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. So the, 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 the first believers expected Jesus to come back. Why? Because the last days started at, at Pentecost. And Jesus taught us to be ready at all times. And remember, that was 2,000 years ago, more than 2,000 years ago, that Jesus said that, so actually almost 10,000 years ago, in Matthew 25, 13, he says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So what should we do in the last days? We're in the last days. If Paul was in the last days, we're in the last days. Well, in the last days, we should move in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because the focus of Pentecost is Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. Some people worry a lot about the signs. When is the Lord coming? Uh, the big sign, the biggest sign that Jesus is coming back is the Holy Spirit who came at Pentecost to help us share the gospel and regroup as many thousands and millions of people to, to be saved. That's the work of, of the Holy Spirit. So the first sign that we need to be very conscious of is the Holy Spirit is on earth, the Holy Spirit is in my heart, the Holy Spirit is in the church. We have to let the Holy Spirit manifest this power, help us preach the word with anointing, and move and expect to be moving in the power of the gifts of the Spirit. The age of the Spirit is what we live in, and it's the greatest sign that Jesus is coming back. And this it is a countdown. So we, we are real close. We're 2,000 years into those last days. So what are the other signs? Well, first, let's make a, a distinction between two things. What the Bible teaches us is that the second coming of Christ will be divided in two events. First, there is the invisible return that could happen anytime. It could happen as, a, as I am preaching right now. We could all be changed, receive a spiritual body, and all go through the roof and, and go into, into heaven because that's what the Bible calls the rapture, the rapture of the church. First, Christ comes to take his bride, to take his beloved, to take the believers, to take the church. This is how Paul prophesied it in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So the rapture is composed of the resurrection. The, the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left 
will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so, hallelujah, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with this word. So the invisible return of Christ could have happened any time in those 2,000 years from the day of Pentecost to today. It could happen today, it could happen tomorrow. Nobody knows, like Jesus said, the hour is something that God has kept secret from us and Jesus decided, even though he knows everything, not to know that. He just, he just said, that's, that's the Father. Because in God, we have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and they all have their functions and, and their ministries. It's, it's a wonderful thing to look at the, the Godhead, at, at God. But then, there is a second phase that happens later, where Jesus comes back in a visible way. And this is to bring judgment, to bring judgment to those who have uh, rejected him. We read in 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 7, this will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. On the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you, because you believed our testimony to you. We will talk more about this next time, about the, the rapture, the invisible coming to take the church when the dead in Christ resurrect and we're transformed and caught up to be in heaven and to go for, from now on to be united in spirit with Christ and then the second phase where it comes to, to judge the, the world, and we'll look at that the, the next time. Many signs have been announced by Jesus, and particularly the, the chapter about the signs is Matthew chapter 24. It's usually called the Olivet Discourse, because uh, he, he was on the Mount of Olives when he spoke to his disciple. Actually, it started with a question from the disciples. Matthew 24, verse 3. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Then, verse 11, many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Verse 24, for false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you these things beforehand. Verse 26, therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, he's in Arizona. When something special is going to happen in America, they say, oh, it's going to be in Arizona. It's going to be there in the desert. I went there, and the UFOs were supposed to come. I wasn't there for the UFOs. I was just traveling. We were traveling through Arizona at that time. And I had a strange feeling in that desert because I, I was thinking, oh, that's where people come, expecting extraordinary magic things to happen. And it's funny that Jesus said, some will say, it's in the desert. Come, come there, and something special will, will, will happen. So we were in Matthew 24, 
and uh, actually we were in 24, 26. Therefore, as they say to you, look, he is in the desert. Do not go out or look. He is in the inner rooms. Do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. So first, Jesus says, there will be a time of deception. There will be a time of deception. A time of going away from the truth. A time of apostasy. Those are the words used in Scripture. In there be also, it will be a time when the faith is uh, lukewarm. Verse 12, we're still in Matthew 24. And because lawlessness, I mean living without respect of laws and of the laws of God, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. That's for lukewarm church. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Amen? Amen? Let's go back to verse 6. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Verse 7. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And today we know everything that is happening all over the world. There are great famines happening. The, the coronavirus is one of the things called here pestilences or pandemics. But there were pandemics too. In the Middle Ages there were pandemics too at the beginning of the 20th century. And people didn't know as much about it because they didn't have television and, and the internet. So it says this is the beginning. Then it says in verse 9, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Universal persecution will be one of the signs that the coming of the Lord is near. But the greatest sign that I would say number two after the coming of the Holy Spirit 2,000 years ago, one of the big signs, one of the last signs I believe is Matthew 24, 14. It's easy to remember. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. See the difference in language here? And then the end will come. So the preaching of the gospel all over the world to all the nations. And we're almost there. The, the Bible has been the Bible or parts of the Bible. And actually, the parts that are translated are the Gospels. That's, that's the first things that uh, Bible translators translate to bring to new tribes, to new languages, to new, new nations. This Gospel of the Kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. World evangelism, which is possible today because of television, because of the internet, because of airplanes, we can go anywhere in the world, or, or boats, or whatever means of transportation that we have today. So we, we live in the partial accomplishment of that great sign. It talks also, Jesus talks also about something mentioned by the prophet Daniel, about tribulation in verse 15. We're still in Matthew 24. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, 
standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, etc., etc. And then he goes, verse 21, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor shall ever be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. And uh, in that time will appear someone, that a character that the, the Bible presents to us as the Antichrist or the opposition of, uh, of Christ. And we can read that also this time in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away or the apostasy comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So the Antichrist will come and attract the attention of the, of the world and say, I'm the, I'm the real God, I'm, I'm the real God, I'm the real, real Christ. But before he appears, here it says, but you, but do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And some people think this is when the Holy Spirit will go back to, to heaven. Then there will be no limit for the Antichrist and the spirit of seduction to, to be all over, all over the world. And it keeps saying here in 2 Thessalonians verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power signs and light wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. In first Thessalonians chapter chapter 5 it says but concerning the times and the seasons that's verse 5 you have no need that I should write to you for you yourself know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night and when they say peace and safety then sudden destruction comes upon them, them. so false peace, a false universal sense of peace, and also scoffing, mocking uh, spirit, spiritual things. Uh, second Peter, scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust. What I noticed as I have been studying prophecy for, I don't know, for 30 or 40 years now, uh, yeah, 40, <laughs> a little more than 40 years, is that most of those signs we can trace all through history in the 2,000 years that we are living in. But in many of those verses, it says, uh, like, for example, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but it's not yet complete. Uh, in, even in Matthew 24, but the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation. So it says, yes, of course, rumors of wars, but there will be then some type of 
cataclysmic. Um, we say cataclysmic in French. Cataclysmic. Wow, give me a hand for this one. That was that was hard. That was hard for me to say. Uh, confrontation of two nations, two kingdoms. Famines, there always been, as, as we said, famines. But some of the signs are, I call signs of the imminence. When those signs come to pass, we know we're getting close. I'm not going to try to give a, a date or a time or a decade, but something happened in the 20th century that hadn't happened for 2,000 years. Since the destruction of Jerusalem by the Emperor Titus, the Jews had been gathered all over the world. They didn't have, uh, uh, they didn't have, uh, in French it's patrie. <laughs> so they didn't have a, a, a kingdom, a place. And what happened in 1948, in 1948, they were declared a nation again. And something happened that is called the Aleya. It's the, the return of the Jews to, to Palestine, to, to Israel. And this is important because when we talk about the second coming, the Bible says that Jesus will come back on the Mount of Olives, where he says that his courses, and we see that in, that in Zechariah, that he will come down. So one of the signs was that the Jews would be back in their, in their country. Let me read it, Matthew 23, 37. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her cheeks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that will happen. When that will happen, the Jews will have been back. Up at this time, more than 118 nations have sent back or have seen Jews that lived among them go back to the nation of Israel. God had promised it in Jeremiah 23.3. I myself will gather the remnant the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back. And we've seen that happen in the 20th century. The other sign, as I just mentioned, is world evangelism, which is possible today. Universal persecution is possible today. But also, the one, one great sign is a passionate love for Christ in the church and a passionate love for Christ all over the world. The, the, the Bible ends with the book of Revelation saying that the, the believers will, with the help of the Holy Spirit will, will, be, will be praying, will be saying, come. This is a Revelation 22, 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. So let's say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desire, let him take the water of life freely. So that will be another sign. When the more your heart, the more my heart will aspire after Christ and will aspire after his return, that will be a sign. Because the Bible is clear, the true believers, the born again believers will not be taken by surprise because of the Holy Spirit. We, it will be something that we, that we sense, there will be a sense. Like I was, I was saying during the worship, the name of Jesus, it's like a fragrance after the rain. And it will come a time when we'll all have that fragrance, that sense, that something that we cannot explain. Oh, he is, he is coming. 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 
and that will be a sign that the rapture is really, really close. I don't believe that there is only negative signs, like the, the, the preaching of the gospel to all nations is a fantastic positive sign. The presence of the Holy Spirit for 2,000 years is a fantastic sign. The return of the, of the Jews to their country as God had promised is a fantastic sign. Are, we are living fantastic moments. We don't have to be afraid. We don't want to be afraid. And we'll talk about that more later. But because what we're waiting for is not catastrophes. It's not terrible things. What we're waiting for is the greatest number saved. What we're waiting for is the coming of Jesus. What we're waiting for is to be transformed. What we're waiting for is to be translated and taken up to heaven. It's something incredible. It's going to be the greatest and the most uh, extraordinary event for the, for the people of faith. That's what we are looking for. Amen? How should we react to all those signs, to that teaching? Well, let's love Christ like never before. Let's desire His, His coming. 2 Timothy 4 8 says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord the righteous just shall give me at that day and not to me only but unto all them also that love his appearing. Do you love the idea that Jesus is coming back? Do you love his, his appearing? This is what must be in your heart, not being lukewarm, but being passionate for Jesus, passionate to pray and to desire His, His coming, sense the Spirit joining us to say, the Spirit and the Bride say, say, come. Also, live in purity, live a life of holiness. In uh, 2 Peter 3, 10, it says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will make, will fare fur and heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? Amen? You can hasten the day of the coming. I can hasten the day of the coming. Amen? We can do it. We can do it because of the Holy Spirit. We can do it because of the power of the gospel. I'm more and more excited about preaching the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation. And all things are possible because of the power of the gospel, because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's believe in the Holy Spirit like never before. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's share our testimony like never before. Let's share it with our neighbors. Let's share it with our friends. Let's share it with our children. Let's share it when we travel. And let's expect the Holy Spirit to make the gospel be received in hearts. We do not convince, but the Holy Spirit convicts. Our call is to proclaim. Our call is to share. Our call is to declare the gospel and even declare things to people that, that, that don't believe it, that don't like it, that maybe are opposed to it. But that's all right. Even things that seem impossible to people because that language of the Bible seems so unrealistic to them. But it has the power when we say it. It has the power when we preach it. It has the power when we witness and we say, Jesus died for you. Jesus resurrected for you. Jesus is interceding for you. Jesus is coming back. And the Bible says this and this and this will happen. And we're getting closer to the time of the second coming of Christ. And you'll be surprised what happens in people's hearts. Because as you share that, the Holy Spirit will bring the conviction. Because it's the work not of the Holy Spirit. It's not just your work. It's not just my work. It's not just the church. 
It's the church and the Holy Spirit. It's you and the Holy Spirit. It's me and the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, occupy till I come. In the parables about his, his return. So I want to I wanna encourage you. I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you to love Jesus. And if you're one of those who hates Jesus, and I know there are people in this world who hate Jesus, well, change. That's what the Bible calls repent. Repent is change your mind. Look how Jesus is the Son of God. Look how Jesus is unique. Look at the miracles of Jesus. Look at His love. He loved you so much that He died on the cross, not because He needed to die, but because you and I were sinners. And the judgment of our sins came upon Him. If you've hated Jesus still today, let Him make a change now. You can feel it. You can feel that fragrance. You can feel that conviction. That's the power of the Holy Spirit in you. You're wrong to hate Jesus. You're wrong to hate Jesus. He's your Savior. You need Him. So today say, Oh God, forgive me because I've hated Jesus. Forgive me because I've left Jesus aside. Forgive me because I went, I went for mere human reasoning and I forgot all that my mother and the church have taught me. And today receive Jesus as your Savior. Say, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, come into my heart. Holy Spirit, give me the new birth. Give me a new life. And you will be a new person right now. If you say, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, come into my heart. The Spirit of God will make a new person out of you. You'll be surprised what you're going to be to do. Do You're going to be surprised. You were talking against Jesus. Now you're going to talk for Jesus. Amen. Amen. And I want to challenge all of us to live a holy life. No matter what people think around you. No matter what people do. Even if it's people that you like and you love and they do the wrong thing, just leave it aside. I'm calling you to sanctification. I'm calling you to holiness. That's how you hasten the day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord. So let's challenge each other. The Bible says we should challenge each other. We should encourage each other. And I want to challenge you to share the gospel. You're blessed when I preach the gospel like I did this morning. But you know you can do it too. You can do it too. You can do it without a microphone. You can do it in, in a very simple way. You can do it around, around the meal. You can, of course, six feet away uh, for now. We have, today we practice six feet away evangelism, right? And that's okay. That doesn't stop the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't, doesn't care about the six feet. He, he will communicate. You know, I pray for people sometimes in a funny way. I see people with the, with the mask and everything. And I say, Holy Spirit, you're stronger than that mask. Holy Spirit, you're stronger. Holy Spirit, you can do it. Let's talk to the Holy Spirit. Let's believe in the Holy Spirit. Let's, let's have the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Let's have the communion of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our senior partner. We're not alone. We have an associate. We have an extraordinary partner, the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. I want to encourage you to come and visit at Brookdale Christian Center. We are at 6030 Xerxes Avenue North in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota 55430. I want to encourage you to share this message. Share it on your Facebook page. Share it on YouTube. Our page is Facebook is BCC Brookdale Christian Center. I encourage you to go on our website, bccag.com, and I encourage you to come and pray with us. Daily we pray on the phone, online, on the phone line at 763-307-2760. We do it at noon from Monday through Friday. And on Wednesday night and Saturday night and Sunday night at 6 o'clock, we also meet for prayer. 
May God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. Amen. Amen.